Next, what is a land-grant university anyway? Then, let's take a tour of historic school buildings and see how they're getting new assignments. And later, learning in-demand skills for good jobs that provide opportunity and hope. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. You may know that Ohio State is a land-grant institution, but you may not know what that means. A lot of people are thinking about that as Ohio State approaches its sesquicentennial. Ohio State historian David Staley, Provost Bruce McFerrin, and President Michael Drake consider 150 years of education at the university and think about the future, too. Loopy's Diner is a mainstay at the Ohio State University Union for students and faculty alike. Inspired by the 1950s, its menu is packed with breakfast favorites, diner-style classics, and sandwiches named for notable student leaders and alumni. And in honor of Ohio State University turning 150, I've gathered a few of these notable leaders together to share about its land-grant mission. President Michael Drake, Provost Bruce McFerrin, and history professor David Staley. Well, I have to say, it is really a privilege to have all of you here today. Ohio State, uh, going into its sesquicentennial, celebrating 150 years. We know Ohio State as a land-grant institution, but what does that mean, and how does that make OSU different from a non-land-grant public university? Well, we're as you said, we're really pleased to be one of the, the country's leading research universities and the land-grant designation comes from the Land-Grant Act of 1862 signed by Abraham Lincoln at the height of the Civil War and this was a federal uh, grant to states to enable those states to start universities that would uh, do two things. One, they would educate the sons and daughters of the people living in the region, essentially the sons and daughters of the middle class, which was great. And second, the universities would work on behalf of and in conjunction with their broader communities to um, do things that, in addition to educating the, the students who were there, they would also contribute directly to their communities. And this was really a transformational piece of thinking at the federal level. You think about you know, 1862, we're in the midst of the Civil War, you know, a really difficult, difficult time. And Congress passed the Homestead Act. They empowered the Transcontinental Railroads in 1862. Things like that expanded us across the nation. The Morrill Act and the land-grant universities lifted us vertically. It brought people up to a point of sharing in the educational power of society. Which is exactly what Justin Morrill wanted. Exactly. <clears throat> the, exactly. Uh, the author of the, of the Morrill Land Grant Act. I think he, he wanted to attend college or university and couldn't. 
uh, and instead went off and became a successful businessman, but wanted others to have that, that opportunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, relentless. It was uh, uh, 10 years. Many years, right. 10 years of work yeah. before it was finally passed. So that was a revolutionary thing. Absolutely. But is the like land really. grant, is that just a 19th century idea or is that mission still relevant today? And if it is, how has Ohio State um, adapted and changed? It's relevant in this very moment and it's one of the great things about this act, the concept of the land grant university, which is to elevate the sons and the daughters of the people of the community and the region broadly and to apply that education to developing new knowledge to solve the problems of society is relevant today and tomorrow. It's been one of the great, uh, part, one of the great parts of the backbone of the growth of this nation over the last 150 years. Uh, these were to be agricultural and mechanical colleges. They would teach agriculture and mechanical arts, what we would today call engineering, and military science. So they had this practical orientation that I think bled very easily and, and quickly to a, to a research focus. And so many people still actually equate the notion of land grant with agriculture because that was so much a part of its founding, you know, it was one of the missions, as David says, that, that really uh, set the tone. But what our major land grant universities have done is they, they've evolved into comprehensive universities, but they haven't lost the commitment to discovering new ideas and translating those to practice, to making them something relevant to society, to solving those complex problems. Uh, so <laughs> what started 150 years ago is still so relevant today. It's amazing to me that that concept could yield so much Very in the 21st century. Very durable. Yeah, it's like a good idea, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> kept Absolutely. Going. And now we have the regional campuses. Yeah. How do they play into the land-grant yeah. mission? As we become a more and more successful university, we become more and more selective and competitive, harder uh, uh, to be admitted. And to maintain the access part of our mission, it's been very helpful to have regional campuses which have a different opportunity for students um, who, for whatever reason, aren't um, uh, interested in coming to or are ready to come to the Columbus campus at the beginning. There still is an Ohio State option for them as they leave high school. And there are many reasons that people are place bound or want to be at a smaller university, et cetera. And so we've been able to broaden access through our regional campuses as we've continued to grow the excellence across the university, including here in Columbus. Yep. Those students are Ohio State students. If you want to be a Buckeye, there are a lot of different doors that you can come in. Was there any specific provision um, historically as part of the land grant that this institution receiving this, this money, this grant, um, must maintain some uh, way of staying affordable for the people that you serve? Uh, I wouldn't use the word must necessarily, but, uh, and to be clear, the, the, the idea was that you would give a grant of land to an institution right. that would then be sold, the proceeds of which then would fund an endowment, and that was written in the moral grant. So it wasn't that you were given a grant of land and then you build right. like the college on that land. Right. That was not the intent of it. It was that there was an land, awful lot of land. land. Yes. Yes. An asset. But the land was the asset. like As an asset. Yeah, a monetizable asset. Oh. And you used that, those proceeds yeah. to be able to build. I just was so, right. emphasizing that point. Yeah. That, Some of the land yeah. was in Ohio. Uh, most of it was sort of west of the Mississippi. And I couldn't tell you exactly where, but it, a, a lot of it was uh, the federal lands mm -hmm. in, the, in the west. And uh, our, our land grant yielded a $350,000 endowment, which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but in the 19th century, that was, that was, a, that was a pretty yeah. sizable endowment uh, and made, I think, other colleges and universities in Ohio quite, uh, quite jealous of us. But it's said very explicitly that the, that the endowment uh, isn't to be used to uh, buy buildings and these sorts of things. Uh, and it was pretty clear the endowment was to uh, make uh, tuition either unnecessary or, and, and in fact, um, that very first day, the Ohio Agriculture Mechanical College, there was no tuition. Uh, we didn't charge tuition. There were fees that were added over time. Fees, yes. And the fees started looking <laughs> more, but at the very beginning in the 1870s, the idea was that there would not be tuition, that that would be an affordable opportunity for these families to be able to send their, their students. And we've been pleased lately to be able to cobble together grants to be able to, particularly for the lowest income families, to be able to uh, make it that that tuition uh, barrier is uh, minimized. But while you think these are not synonyms, affordability and access, yes. but affordability clearly helps define access. Yes.
to education. Gentlemen, thank you. I have really enjoyed talking to you all and appreciate you educating us about land grant, what that mission is, and the remarkable history here at Ohio State. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, Jeff Darby visits some historic school buildings. Then, learning in-demand skills for good jobs that provide opportunity and hope. Not every memory about school is fond, but we're often sentimental about the buildings where we attended classes and hung out with friends. On this Driving with Darby, architectural historian Jeff Darby visits historic school buildings that are still being used. He also explores efforts to repurpose schools that are facing the wrecking ball. The Civic Center was completed between the end of World War I and the 1930s. The first building was Central High School. Built in 1924 uh, in a classical style, built of limestone, and a very impressive building. Uh, education was always important in Columbus, and this was the principal high school for the city. It's not the only building in the city that was used as a school. We have several other really good schools that are still in use, and I'd really like to show you some of those. We're on the Near East Side of Columbus, uh, an area of the city that began to develop really after the 1890s. And as the area grew, they needed a high school, and they built one called East High School in 1922. Uh, you'll notice uh, that it's very similar in design to Central High School, uh, inspired by classical architecture of Greece and Rome. They often were ornamented with uh, inspirational sayings and classical detailing. That was the whole idea of uh, building these schools, uh, to, to inspire people to be better citizens. We're going now to the Fair Avenue School on the east side of the city. This is an older school. It was built in 1890. And you'll notice the style is distinctly different. It's a style called Romanesque Revival. It's built of brick, not of stone, uh, but equally impressive. And uh, served this neighborhood for many years, and it's an art school now. Now let's go to German Village and Stewart Avenue School, uh, one of the oldest in the city. Hi, Carol. Hi, Jeff. Nice How to you? see you. Thank Good you for coming you. out today. Thank you. Carol was with Columbus City Schools in charge of capital improvements and oversaw the uh, renovation of about a dozen historic schools in the Columbus system. So tell me about uh, this school, Stewart Avenue. It uh, used to be New Street School. It's from the 1870s, oldest in the system. What happened here? Well, this building actually was valued by the community. It's part of the greater German Village area and was a very active uh, lottery school. It's not, it wasn't a neighborhood school at the time. And then in about 2012, we had a fairly significant arson fire, did about a million and a half in damage to the school. It was not slated to uh, be renovated for quite a few years after that. And with some creative uh, looking at our capital funds, we were able to put together a package to go ahead, get the state matching funds, and go ahead and do the complete renovation. Uh, as part of that, uh, a neighborhood group got involved, and it now is a combination of a neighborhood school as well as a lottery school. Tell me about some of the other schools the district was able to save similarly. I think the biggest ones um, are the landmark buildings in each of the neighborhoods, East High School, South High School, and Lyndon McKinley High mm -hmm. School. The last one is West High School that is scheduled for a later uh, bond issue with the district. High schools have a lot of meaning to a community. A lot of neighborhood pride and very popular with the community. Well, and Columbus City Schools should be, get a lot of credit for doing this. So many communities have lost their, <coughs> lost their schools. Uh, and it seems to me that the oldest one in the system probably is a, is a great symbol of, of yeah, that effort. Really and, you know, we've, we've come to a point where the city and the city schools recognize the importance of these landmarks. They're more than just buildings. They're more just, than just bricks and mortar and stone. So I think as a city, we should be proud that we've been able to make modern educational facilities uh, within historic buildings that continue to contribute to the character of their neighborhoods. Next, learning in-demand skills for good jobs. Then, an intricate collection of 19th century needlework. There are many paths to success when you're looking for a career. 
college is one, but it's not the only way to make it in today's economy. In fact, there's a real need for people in skilled trades. WOSU is exploring career pathways in a public media initiative called American Graduate. Producer Leticia Wiggins is exploring opportunities for students outside the college classroom. Leland, thank you so much for joining me today. I really wanted to hear a little bit about impact, and I realize that you're the program manager here at the organization, and do you mind telling us just a little bit about impact? Yeah, well, first, thank you for having an interest in our programming, and I am the program manager of vocational training and certification, and also of our Building Futures program, uh, which are two programs that are designed to help uh, individuals become trained to get into the construction fields or the skilled trade fields. So in thinking about Building Futures and then also the project with Impact with VTAC, mm -hmm. how do these two programs help connect the dots? And is this classroom a part of this too where we're sitting right now? Both programs, uh, VTAC and Building Futures, aim to give individuals training to get them into the skilled trades, but they're kind of different routes. Um, so Building Futures is designed to get people into the union apprenticeship programs. Uh, so that program is actually designed to, to get people on a path to be in the unions and to be a trade person in that route. This classroom is where individuals in that program start because I think there's a, a misconception about how much academic work is, is needed in the trades, but you have to have some skills in math. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we're turning out individuals that can go out and be an electrician or go out and be a carpenter, and you need some academic skills to do that. So in both uh, tracks, VTAC and Building Futures, they start off in the classroom, and they start off getting the soft skills training, um, how, to, how to operate on a work site, um, what to expect when you go onto that work site, because a construction work site is a lot different than maybe your average office. Um, and then they get the academic part, particularly the math, because that is, uh, pretty major component of most of the trades. Yeah, and I think that the, this program is so interesting and important because um, it sort of pushes against this stigma about what, what does an education need to look like? Right. And what is the, um, the benefit of a skilled trade? Yeah, I think there are a ton of people that don't realize economically what kind of living you can make as a skilled tradesperson. I mean, a lot of people um, that our tradesmen make upwards of $100,000 a year with no student loan debt. We've taken individuals through both of our programs from unemployment in a homeless shelter to making over $50,000 a year in 12 weeks. There's not a lot of places that can say they can do something like that. So we're really proud of, of what we can do with our program and, and we're proud of how we design them. They're really comprehensive. Uh, we're, we're making sure that people are trained, but we're also supporting them. Um, so when individuals come through our programming, they get a case manager that's helping them make sure that all the other issues outside of work are taken care of. If they need child care, um, if they need help with their rent, if they need utility assistance, if they need a car or car repairs, anything that would block them from being able to take advantage of this opportunity, we have things in place to kind of help with correcting that. And I think that's why our programs are so successful. And the program is specifically hit at Impact's mission, it seems like, right? Yes. This is at the top of it. Our mission is to take people and, and make them self-sufficient, help them become self-sufficient. Uh, we don't want to just provide jobs. We want to provide career paths. The ultimate goal is when you're finished with, with our programs, you don't need us anymore. Um, you're able to take care of your family. You're able to be a productive part of society. Um, you're paying taxes back into the community. You're able to purchase a home. Uh, all the things that a community is built on is what we are trying to get individuals, we're trying to get them to that point. Leland, thank you so much for sitting down and sharing this information today. No problem, no problem at all. I really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about our programs. And again, one thing that we want to continue to do is make these opportunities available to as many people as possible. There's more to school than reading, writing, and arithmetic, and what those additional subjects are depends on when you were born. In the 19th century, for example, it was thought that needlework was an indispensable skill for women. Here's more from the Ohio History Connection.
Hi, Hannah. Hey, Brent. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, uh, no pressure, but I understand you're gonna keep us in stitches today. Yes, very much so today. What do we have here? So we have some embroidery samplers from our permanent collection. What are we sampling? So we are sampling uh, embroidery stitches. These would have been done by young girls in the 1700s, 1800s. So this is their way to practice those skills that they'll use into adulthood. How old are these girls when they do this? So they could be anywhere from six to 16, at least for the samplers that we have in our collection. 1834, what do we know about the Mary Ann Edmondson? Yes, so we know that Mary Ann Edmondson was 10 when she made this, because we know she was born in 1824, and this is from 1834. And we know that this was done in Dayton, Ohio, at the Waynesville School. Is this something they're learning from their mom, or is there a formal education where they're learning this? So it honestly depends. So some girls may be learning from an older relative, but lots of girls are going to be taking formal classes or going to a school where this is part of the curriculum. What were these schools like? What do we know about the school from this kind of work? So we know in the case of Mary Ann that the school where she took this class, she was being trained in both plain and ornamental sewing. So we know that they had a fairly rigorous curriculum in terms of sewing at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. And do I understand that when a suitor came calling, this would actually show off their skills? Yes, yeah, you can think of this like a resume almost. So obviously there are lots of things that go into a successful marriage proposal, but these girls would use these samplers as a way to show off their skills. If it includes a Bible verse, it helps to show off their virtue. So it's all kinds of things that the suitor might want to know about them. Well, this is beautiful. Now you have another piece or two you want to show us? Absolutely, yes. I'll be pulling a couple more from another case down here. So we have a couple in here that we can talk about. Yeah, let's see what you have. All right, so we can start with the one over here. That on looks the like it's the side. oldest, maybe. It's one of our older ones, yeah. So this one is from probably around 1800, 1825 at the latest. Mm -hmm. And this one was actually not made in Ohio. This one, we believe, was actually made in Wales. And uh, how much has this faded over the years? Do we know, would this been much more vibrant and colorful 200 years ago? So it likely would have been, yes. So textiles are one of the most vulnerable to light damage of uh, historic objects. And so in the case of these, probably the fabric in the back has become discolored and some of the colors of the threads may have faded. Though of course there's a lot of variation depending on the kind of thread and the color. What's the next one you want to point out? So the next one is this one here in the center. This was done by a girl named Mary S. Waters when she was eight years old in 1822. Did she live in Ohio? She did live in Ohio as a married woman. So this was actually made when she was in Pittsburgh. She attended a seminary school there that was for just women and she learned how to sew there and made this as a student there again in 1822. What's the term? Is this embroidery? Is this cross stitch? Is it crocheting? What is this? So this is going to be embroidery and sometimes they're using a cross stitch, but they're going to be using a variety of stitches. So it's not crocheting, but it is embroidery and it's sometimes cross stitch. And of course people still do this. Yes, absolutely. We get a lot of people in who really want to see these because they still do samplers and they still use these techniques. Were they starting from a pattern like people do today? Most likely, yes. So we have evidence on some of the samplers of pencil marks where they would have been drawing out the pattern beforehand. And if they're receiving formal education and how to do it, they likely are following some sort of pattern. Well, these are beautiful and impressive. Thank you for sharing them with us. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods.
live our lives with each other near. Hope the time would never end, but in the end it disappeared. These were our high school years. These were our high school years. Here comes fall in this world. We seem to evolve, finding out who we're meant to be. At best, overwhelms the more pressing needs. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State. Changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.